work during the first part of the course. Now in this section, we will start covering how objects are stored in memory and how this is related to your Python code. You might have heard this phrase before, in Python, everything is an object. And this is actually true. Let's see why. Let's see some examples. Let's confirm that basically everything that we have been working with so far is an object. Let's first write a print statement and let's print the word object. You can see that this word changes color because this is a special word. Right here we can see the output class object. Object is the base class from which all classes in Python inherit. This defines all the basic attributes and functionality of any object that any object should have. Let's start testing whether values that we have been using so far are instances of this class. So we will print is instance. Let's check if an integer is an instance of object. Initially, we might not think that this is an object, right? But let's see what we get. Right here, we see the value true. 5 is an instance of object, so integers are objects as well. Let's comment these lines out, and now let's print if, for example, a list is an instance of object. This makes more sense, right? Because lists have methods that we can access. So right here, we see true. Now, if we test this with, for example, a tuple, we can see that this is true as well. Let's also test strings. Hello world. Let's see if this is an instance of object. Right here we see the value true. If we make a very simple dictionary, like this one for example, let's test if dictionaries are objects as well. And that is true. We see right here in the output. Something that you might find surprising is that truth values are objects as well. The value false is an instance of object. You can see true right here. And if we pass the value true right here, we also see the output true. So truth values are objects as well. And last but not least, we will test if functions are objects. So right here, we have a function definition, a very simple function. And we're going to test if this function is an object. We just pass the name of the function right here. We're assigning a generic name, f, which is really not very descriptive, but we're just using this for the example. And object, if we run the code, we can see that this is true. Functions are objects as well. And finally, if we define a generic class, let's say movie, and we just assign a basic init method, like for example, title, if we check if this class, the movie class, is an instance of object, we can confirm that classes are objects themselves. The movie class itself is an object. So basically, everything that we have been working with so far is an object, and you can confirm that basically everything in Python is an object. So as you saw in the previous examples, basically everything in Python is an object including integers, floats, booleans, functions, lists, tuples, dictionaries, strings, exceptions, and any other element that you can use in your code is an object. So let's see how they work. An object is stored in memory when it is created after running the program. The particular place in memory where that object is stored can be identified by its ID which is the memory location where it is being stored in the computer's memory. For example, when we create a list object in our program, that object is stored in memory. Let's say that this box represents that place in memory, and that place in memory is referenced by the variable that we assign it to, if we assign it to a variable. In this case, we are assigning it to a variable, so this memory location is referenced by that name. That object is assigned a unique ID, that particular memory location while it exists in the program. The ID represents the memory location of the object. If we create another object, like for example right here we have two list objects assigned to different variables, the second object will be stored in memory as well, in its own memory location, and it will have its own unique ID while the program is running. This principle can also be applied to other types of objects, including strings, 
tuples, dictionaries, and even objects from classes that you have defined, where we create instances, for example, of the doc class that we've defined previously in our code. We create objects that contain attributes and data, and these objects are stored in memory. When we assign them to variables, we are just assigning a reference to that memory location to the variable. And each one will have their own unique ID while the program is running or while they exist in the program. Every object that you create in the program is stored in memory while the program is running and while the program is able to access that object. Programs keep track of how many references to the object exist. And what is a reference? Well, a reference is just a name that refers to the location in memory of an object so we can access it and work with it in our code. Examples of references include variables, attributes, and any other item in our code that somehow references the object and keeps it alive and accessible for us in the program. We use a variable to access an object. We use an attribute to access an object. And we can also use other types of items, for example, if the object is part of a list or if it's part of a data structure that will keep the object alive and referenced in our program. Variables in Python store references to the objects in memory. This is very important because sometimes we might think that when we assign a value or an object to a variable, that variable holds the object. And this is not the case in Python. In Python, variables store references to the objects. The object is stored somewhere in memory, and the variable knows where to get that object from memory because it has a reference to that object. We have like an intermediary. The variable knows where to look for the object in memory. And that is basically what happens behind the scenes. So when we assign a value to a variable, we're actually assigning a reference to the memory location where this object is stored. Somewhere in memory, right here we have the object 5. The variable knows where to look for that particular object in memory. When there are no references left to the object in the program, then the object is deleted automatically from memory. This occurs when the object is no longer accessible by the program. We have an object right here that we created and we stored in memory. But in the program, we have no way to access the object because there are no references, variables, or items that we can use to work with the object. In that case, the object is just deleted automatically from memory by Python. This process is called garbage collection, and it is done automatically to improve memory usage, to optimize the efficiency of Python programs. Great, now take a moment to think about the importance of garbage collection. Why is it important that objects that are not used or cannot be used anymore are deleted from memory? Think about this and then go to the next video. I will see you there. Now you will learn about the ID function in Python and how it is related to the objects in your program. This is the ID function id followed by parentheses and in those parentheses we will write the name or the variable that references the object in memory for which we want to find the id this function basically returns the address of the object in memory remember that we said that when we create an object that object is stored somewhere in memory at a specific memory location this function helps us know the address of the object in memory. This is the ID that we mentioned in the previous video. Let's see what we can learn about it in the documentation. If we go to the Python documentation to the article on built-in functions, right here, if we go to the third column, we can find the ID function. If we click on it, Right here we see that the function id takes an object as argument, so we will need to specify an object when we call id. The function returns the identity of an object. This is an integer, an integer which is guaranteed to be unique and constant for this object during its lifetime. This is really important, during its lifetime. Two objects with non-overlapping lifetimes may have the same id value. This last line is very important because if an object doesn't exist anymore, the same ID can be assigned to a different object. 
so it is guaranteed to be unique and constant for an object only during its lifetime. In CPython, the version of Python that you download from the official website, the ID is the address of the object in memory. Okay, so that is the meaning of the integer that we will get, the address of the object in memory. So now you know the purpose of the ID function and that the ID is unique for each object while the object exists in the program. Let's see some examples of the use of the ID function. If we create an object in our program, we can use the ID function to find that unique integer that identifies the object and its location in memory. For example, if we want to print the ID of an integer, 15, we can do so. We save the file, we run the code, and right here we see the memory address for that object. This is a unique integer that will identify this object while it exists in the program. Then, for example, we can check this, hello world. If we comment out this line and we run the code again, we will see this number, which is different from the previous ID for the integer. You can see both of them right here. They are not the same object in memory. Also, each time we run the program, you will notice that the numbers are different because the objects are stored in different places in memory each time we run the program. They are not kept at the same memory location after the program completes its execution. We can also find an ID for a list that we create in our program, right here. Let's also see what happens if we have two lists with the same value, like one, two, three, four, five. What will we get right here if we print the ID of A and the ID of B? We can also pass right here within parentheses as argument the name of the variable that references the object. In this case, we are finding the ID for A and the ID for B. We run the code, and right here we can see that these values are different. So these numbers are indeed unique, and what is this telling us about the objects? Well, that they are stored in different locations in memory. So these two lists are separate objects. Each one of them is stored at a different memory location. Try this yourself, create some objects in Python, and check their ID. Welcome to this example. Now we will apply the ID function to instances of the backpack class that we create. Right here we have our class with the init method and an initially empty list of items. To complete the class, and to make it a little bit more realistic, let's add a getter for the items attribute, like this. Okay, so now let's define our two instances, my backpack and then your backpack. We will check that they are indeed different objects because they will be stored at different memory locations. How can we do this? Well, we are going to print the ID of my backpack. That will give us the memory location of this object. And then we are going to print the ID of your backpack. We will see where these two objects are stored. And if they are different, we can confirm that they are different objects in memory. Let's save the file and run the code and see what we get. Right here we see that the numbers are indeed different. These digits are basically the same, but these last four digits are different. So we know that these two objects are not the same object in memory. They are stored at different locations in memory. And this is how you can use the id function to confirm that your objects are different objects in memory. This will be very helpful when we start talking about aliasing, mutation, and cloning. In Python, we have an operator called is that is very closely related to object-oriented programming. Let's see what it is and how we can use it in our programs. This is the basic syntax of the is operator. We write two objects as the operands, one to the left and one to the right of the operator. And we ask if object one is object two. When we write this, we're actually asking if these two variables reference the same object in memory. 
But here I'm writing object 1 and object 2, but really they will be variables referencing objects. If the variables reference the same object in memory, this will be true. If not, this will be false. Let's see what we can learn about this operator in the Python documentation. In the expressions article of the documentation, right here we can click on the table of contents where it says identity comparisons. If we click on it, we will reach the part of the documentation that explains more about the ES operator. We see identity comparisons. The operators is and is not test for an object's identity. An object has a value, an identity, and a type. The is operator tests the identity. So x is y is true if and only if, so this means that the comparison should work both ways, x is y and y is x, only if x and y are the same object. An object's identity right here is determined using the id function. So you can see that they are closely related. When the IDs are the same, is will be true. When the IDs are different, they are different objects in memory, so comparing them with is will be false. We can also use the combination is not to test if an object is not another object. This yields the inverse truth value. If we apply the ID function to two variables and their IDs are different, then that means that they do not reference the same object. And that will be very helpful to determine the result of the is operator. For example, right here we have two lists with the same value. But since we are defining them like this, they represent different objects in memory. In memory, they are kept or stored at different memory locations and they are independent. So their IDs will be different. In contrast, if two variables do reference the same object in memory, then when we apply the id function, they will have the same id. For example, right here we have two variables that reference the same object in memory. This object right here, the list. Right here we are creating the list and we are assigning it to the variable a. We are assigning a reference to this object in memory that points right here to this location. And right here below, when we assign A to B, we are actually assigning the same reference to this variable B. Therefore, right here we have the is operator, which is a very helpful tool. The is operator returns true if both operands reference the same object. If the two variables or references reference the same object, the result will be true. Else, it will return false. I'm sure that you must be asking yourself right now about the difference between is and the equal to operator. How can we use them and how are they different? Well, they are actually quite different in their functionality. Let's see why. The is operator checks the objects that we are comparing, checks if the references or the variables actually point or refer to the same object. But the equal to operator checks the values of the objects and you can customize how this works behind the scenes. You will learn how to do this when we reach special methods. But for now, we are just confirming that this checks the values of the objects. It returns true if they both have the same value and false otherwise. So two objects may have the same value like you saw in a previous example, and they can still be different objects in memory because they will be stored at different memory locations, they will be independent, and changing one of them will not affect the other one. Right here we have an example. We will see an example of how two objects can have the same value and still represent different objects in memory. If we define these two lists, A and B, with the same value because they contain the same elements, then let's see what we get from the is operator compared to the equal to operator. If we write a is b, that is not precisely the same as writing a equals b. This will be true if a and b are the same object in memory, but this will be true if they have the same value, and that is very different. An object has an identity, this one, a type, and a value. 
and they are not necessarily the same. Let's save the file and run the code, and right here you can see that these values are different. A is B was false, because these objects are not the same object in memory. Their identities are not the same. And A equals B was true, because they do have the same value. We can also test that the is operator is closely related to the ID of an object. Because right here, if we print the result of calling the ID function for each one of the objects, we will see that the IDs are different. So that is why this result is false. They are different objects in memory. And this is an example of the difference between is and equal to. Awesome. Think about this difference and when you should use the is operator versus the equal to operator. Think about this and then move on to the next video to continue learning more about objects in memory. Welcome back and welcome to this example where we will test how the is operator works with different data types and different objects that we create in our program. First of all, let's start by writing two lists. But these lists will not have the same value. So let's see how this works. Right here, we have the two lists and we are going to check if A is B. In this case, that is false because these are not the same object in memory. But what happens if right here I choose to assign A to B? We might initially think that we are just creating a copy of this list and assigning it to B, right? But that is not the case. We are not creating an independent copy. If we run the file, we see that this is true. So these two variables are now referencing the same object in memory. And if we modify the list through any one of these variables, the other one will also be affected because they are both referencing the same object that we are modifying. Okay? We can also check this with tuples. A, B, and C, and we have another tuple with E and F. Now let's print if C is D. And this is not true. They are not the same object in memory. But this comparison should also work the other way around. It should work if we check if D is C. That is why we saw in the documentation that this is if and only if. It works both ways. If we run the file, we see false for both of these lines. So, the comparison is working as we expected. It is equivalent to compare C and D, or D and C. Now let's test this with some strings. For example, hello world, and then hello world. Right here, we are comparing two strings that do have the same value. So let's see what we get. Right here we have to delete this. E is F, F is E. We save the file, we run the code, and we see true as the output. And this is something that you will learn more about in the coming video. Why, if we are defining them separately, we are creating two separate strings right here, like we did with the list. And we are also assigning them to different variables. So why are they the same object in memory? You will learn more about these unexpected results in a coming video in this section. And let me tell you that it is very interesting. It has to do with something that Python does to optimize memory usage. Great work so far. Now you know what the ID of an object is, how to use the ID function, and how this function is related to the is operator. When you're ready, Go to the next video and I will see you there. When you work with the is operator in Python, there might be some unexpected results. For certain values, the result might not be what we initially expect. And these variations come from implementation details of Python. that are used to optimize memory usage. This can vary a lot depending on your programming environment and your Python version. For example, let's see one of the unexpected results that you might get. If we assign the value 5 to these two variables a and b, and then we print the result of a is b, 
to check if these two values represent the same value in memory or not, we run the code, we will see that this is actually true. These two variables reference the same object in memory. But we didn't do this explicitly, we didn't write something like this, like we used to do before, right? So what is happening right here? Let's see more about this. Small integers are one of these cases, specifically small integers ranging from minus 5 to 256. If we go to the documentation, we can learn more about why this happens. We can go to the article Integer Objects, and right here you will see below a small, a very small paragraph that explains what is happening behind the scenes. We see that the current implementation keeps an array of integer objects for all integers between minus 5 and 256. When you create an int, an integer, in that range, you actually just get back a reference to the existing object. So when we access one of these integers from minus 5 to 256, we're actually reusing existing objects. The integers with the same value will be the same object in memory. We are reusing an object that already exists in memory. And we can confirm this in our code. Let's do that. Let's try this again with a number in the range that we saw, minus 5 and 256. If we check if A is the same object as B, and we run the code, we see this value, true. We are getting a reference to the existing object that represents the value 3. But now let's use a number, let's assign a number that doesn't fall in that range. We said 256. 256 was the upper bound of the range. So let's use 257. Now, if we compare, if we check if these two variables reference the same object, we also see true. These two values reference the same object in memory. This is a memory optimization done by PyCharm. Because, for example, if we write the number 15,000, and then we check if these two objects are the same, then we get true. PyCharm is optimizing this for any number that we can write in our code. Like, for example, 15,345. But let's see the difference with another programming environment like idle. And I am defining these two variables, a and b, with the number 257. a is b now evaluates to false. Previously, it was true when we worked in PyCharm. Now let's write 256. And now we see that this is true. Now let's test this with the lower bound of the interval. This is true, minus 5 is being optimized. We are using the existing object in memory. But now let's write minus 6, and let's see what we get. Now we are not optimizing this in memory. We are not reusing an object. This is not being reused. But in PyCharm, we are reusing this object. If we write minus 6, this is true, because these numbers are referencing the same object in memory. The environment in PyCharm is sort of optimizing memory usage. Strings also have certain memory optimizations, like in the example that you saw in the previous video. We defined two separate strings, but they were actually the same object in memory. And this is done through a process called string interning. Let's see what it is with an example. Let's see what happens if we try to determine if these two variables reference the same object in memory. Right here, we have a string of length 1 the same string. If we save the file and we run the code, we see the value true. These two strings represent the same object in memory, so these two variables reference the same object in memory. And how is this possible? Well, strings are immutable, so they cannot be changed after they are created in the program. If we try to update the value of a string of a character in a string, we will get this error. Type error string object does not support item assignment. This tells us that strings are immutable and they cannot be changed. So that is why we have the process of string interning. 
This is the process of keeping only one distinct copy of the string in memory, and then reusing that copy when we need to in our program. We're only going to create one object. Let's think about this for a moment. Strings are immutable, right? So they cannot be changed. So it really doesn't make sense to create a separate object in memory for each one of these strings since they are all the same. Sometimes what Python will do is optimize memory usage by just creating one object for that string and then reusing the object throughout the program. So when we try to use the string again, we will get a reference to the same string that we created before. And this will not cause any problems because the string is immutable. It cannot change. Let's see some examples of this. And now we will use the ID function. Let's see what happens with a very simple string, like for example, hi. We will check this with the ID of the string. Let's see if the IDs are all the same. If we assign the same string to multiple variables like A, B, C, and D, like this. If we assign the same string to these four variables, what will we get? As you can see, we get the same ID for all of them. So they are all represented by the same object in memory. This object was created in memory and all of these objects, the subsequent strings that we use that are equal to it, are sort of like recycled. They use the same object that we initially created because strings are immutable. And this is a memory optimization that Python can make behind the scenes. So if we check if A is B and B is C and C is D, we see true because all of these variables reference the same object in memory. Now in this short lecture, we will see some of the internal details of what actually happens when we pass objects as arguments to functions in our code. In a programming language, usually objects can be passed by either value or reference. Passing an object by value just means that we make an entirely new copy of the object when it is passed as an argument to the function. And passing the object as reference means that we take a reference to the object as argument, sort of like the flag of where that object is stored in memory, and if we make any modifications to the object while the function is running, those modifications will affect the object directly in memory, if the object is mutable. In Python, objects are passed by reference. So any changes that we make to the object in the function will affect the object permanently, if the object is mutable, like a list. We pass a reference to the object, so we don't pass a new copy. The original object can be modified. Let's see an example of this. For example, if we define a list like this one right here, and then we define a function, print data, or print elements, for example, we're going to print the data stored or the values stored in the list. For every element in the sequence, what are we going to do? We are going to print that element. Let's call the function print data and let's pass the sequence A. Let's rename this to my list to be more descriptive, like this. And then as the output, we see this right here. The function runs and each one of the elements in the sequence is accessed. But right here, notice that we are passing an object. We are passing the list object that we defined right here. And this object is passed by reference. We get a reference to this object and we see right here the parameter that will take that reference. We can confirm that we are actually working with the same object inside the function if we print its ID. We're going to print the ID of the parameter, let's say inside the function, and we are going to say first we're going to print outside the function. Let's see if the ID of the list and the sequence are equal. That way we can confirm that we're referring to the same object in memory even after we call the function and once we're inside the function. This is what passing by reference implies. We're not creating a copy of the list. We're working with the same list object within the function. 
We save the file and we run the code. And right here, we see the output that we expected. We see outside the function, this is the ID of my list. This is the output that we get from this line of code. Outside the function and we print the ID of my list object. And then once we call the function and we start running its code, we can print the ID of the sequence that we are getting inside the function. And that ID is the same ID of the list. We are not creating a new object when the function starts running. We are referring to the same object in memory, the same list. When we pass the list as argument right here, we are actually passing a reference to the object. We are passing sort of like its ID, a flag that tells the program where that object is stored so it can be modified and accessed. Now we will work with the same list that we just defined in our previous example, my list. But we will define a function that will change the sequence, change the list. We will say for i in the range for the length of the sequence, for each one of the elements in the sequence, what do we want to do? We want to multiply each element by 2. Okay, so we can call this function passing my list like this. In our previous example, we didn't modify the sequence. We just confirmed that this sequence that we're passing right here as an argument is the same object, the same sequence that we are working with inside the function. We are passing that object by reference. But right now we will see how we can modify the sequence inside the function because we are passing it by reference. Let's write the print statement that we wrote before outside the function and then the ID of my list. And then we're going to copy this when the function starts, but now we will say inside the function. This will modify the list, the original list in memory. Okay, so after we modify the list, we want to check its new value. It will mutate the list object that we have right here. So after we call the function, this will be different. Let's save the file and run the code. We see the output. Outside the function, we have this ID for the list. And we can see that this is the same ID that we get inside the function. We are passing a reference to this sequence. So we can modify the original object in memory and access its values. In the function, we are multiplying each one of the elements by two and then reassigning that result as the new element. All elements were multiplied by two, but this modified the original object that we passed as an argument. We didn't make a new copy of the list. We modified the original object that we passed by reference. If we have a function phi total that takes a list of sales objects, we can pass it as an argument. We can pass this list as an argument and operate with the individual values by reference. Like we do right here, we have an initial total, which is equal to zero. We have a for loop. For each sale in the list of sales, this will be an object of type sale. And then we access the amount of the sale or the total of the sale, and we add that amount to the total sales. And then we return the total. In the list that we will pass this argument, we will hold the individual sale objects as elements. We will use them in the for loop. So when we iterate over the list of sales, we are actually assigning each one of the sales to this loop variable right here. First, it will be this sale object with an amount of 400, then the second sale object with an amount of 345, and finally the third sale object with an amount of 45. Let's see how this works if we have a list of objects. Right here, we will define the sale class. And what do we want to represent for each sale? Well, the total amount of the sale. We will make this class simple because we want to illustrate the principles of how we can operate with lists of objects in our program and combine object-oriented programming with imperative programming, writing our code line by line. We will define our class and we will also define a function. This function is not part of the class. The function just takes a list of sales and finds the total, the total amount from all the sales. 
So we say for every sale in the list of sales, we want to add the amount of the sale to the total. And then we will return the total like this. We could also assign a more descriptive name like the sales list. This will be a sale object. We know that it will be a sale object so we can access its attribute amount that we've defined right here in our class. After the function, we can make, for example, a list of sale instances. January sales. We create a sale instance with an amount of 400. Then we create another sale instance with an amount of 345. And then we create another sale with an amount of 45. Right here, we are creating a list that contains sale objects. And we are creating the objects directly right here. After we have our list of objects, we can just find the total of all the sales by calling this function, find total. January sales. We are passing the list of sale objects. We have it right here as the parameter and we are passing it as an argument. So we call the function and the function will return the total of all the sales in the list and we will print that value. If we save the file and we run the code, we see the value 790. This is 745 plus 45 is 790. If we want to see how this process is evolving, we can add some print statements. New sale, and we can print the sale amount, like this. So we can see the process. New sale, 400, this instance that we have right here, then new sale, 345, the second instance, and finally new sale, 45, the third instance that we have right here. So you can see that we can use our objects in our code as well. We can combine different programming paradigms. Great work so far. Now you know how objects are stored in memory, what the ID of an object represents, how to use the ID function, the is operator, and how to work with objects in your program, combining different programming paradigms. Welcome to this section. Now that you know how objects are stored in memory, we will dive into three new concepts, aliasing, mutation, and cloning. You will commonly find them when you work with object-oriented programming. So let's begin. Think about this for a moment. In the real world, what is an alias? What do we use aliases for? Pause the video and then come back because we will be covering aliasing first in the section. Welcome back. According to Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, an alias is used to indicate an additional name that a person sometimes uses. In programming, having an alias is very similar to that because an object has an alias if there are two or more references to the same memory address or to the same object in the program. This is an example. Right here we have two variables, a and b. We saw this example before in the previous section, but we were focusing on the fact that they both point or reference the same memory location. Right now we are focusing on the fact that we have two different names referring to the same object, to the same memory address. And this is what an alias is in object-oriented programming. Two names or more that refer to the same object. If we define, we create a list object right here, and then we assign the same reference to another variable, then we can access that list object with any one of these two variables. And we can modify it, we can access it, and we can use that object in our program with these two aliases that we are creating. We can confirm that they are aliases with the ID function, like this. Why? Because the, if the IDs are equal, then that means that the two variables are aliases for the same object. And we confirm that they are indeed aliases because they have the same ID. We can also check this with the is operator. If A is B, that means that both of these variables reference the same object in memory. So let's save the file and run the code and we see that this is true. 
both variables reference the same object in memory, so they are aliases. So basically, an alias is just a different name that is assigned to the same object. And these multiple names are active in the same program. We can access or refer to the same object with either one of those names. We can even have more than one alias in the same program. Let's see an example of this in our code. We can, in theory, create more than one alias in our program, although this would not be recommended. But in theory, we can do that. And we can reference the same object with any one of these aliases, A, B, C, or D. Notice that right here, we are assigning the reference of A to B, then B to C, then C to D. If we check if they are all referencing the same object, then we see that this is true. We can check this with the id function. We just need to write four print statements right here, a, b, c, and d. We run the code, and now we see that the four ids are equal. So they are all referencing the same object. We could also assign the reference of a to each one of these variables, and it will work exactly the same. This is what is happening behind the scenes in this example. All of these variables that we have defined right here, a, b, c, and d, are referring to the same object in memory. And right here, this is just a sample id, a sample number that could have been the id for the object. They would all have the same id, okay, because they reference the same object in memory. And that is part of the importance of id and the id function that you learned about in the previous section. This way, by using the id, we can identify if two or more references are aliases for the same object. Now think about the risks of aliasing. We will cover this in this section, but start thinking about what do you think could happen if two or more variables reference the same object in memory. Is this good? Is this bad? And what are the risks? Welcome to this example where we will dive into aliasing with classes that we define in our program. Let's start with our circle class. We start by defining the init method with just a radius to keep the class simple. First, we will define a mycircle instance. This instance will have a radius of 4. And then we are going to create your circle, another instance. But now we are going to assign the my circle instance. Initially, you might think that you are creating another circle object, like a copy, and assigning it to your circle. But you're not. You're just creating another name for the same circle. These two names will be used to access the same circle right here. So, let's check if they reference the same object. If my circle is your circle. That is true. My circle is your circle, so they are aliases. They have the same ID. What are the implications of creating aliases like this? Well, if you don't know that these two names reference the same object in memory, you might make some modifications to this, for example, to this instance, and then believe that that will not affect this instance. And this is a likely source of bugs in your code. For example, let's say that you don't know that they reference the same object. So you want to update the radius of your circle. What is going to happen? If now we print the radius of my circle and we print the radius of your circle, Let's print the radiuses before and after we make this change. And we save the file and we run the code. You can see that before we make the change right here, the radius was 4 for both instances, because they are both referencing this circle object with radius 4. Then we update the radius of your circle to 18. But this is surprising if you don't know what aliasing is in Python. We expected to change your circle's radius to 18. And right here we changed it. But we also changed this one to 18. The radius of my circle. 
Why? Because they are the same object in memory. And that is a very likely source of bugs if you don't know the concept of aliasing and how to work with it and even avoid it in Python. Awesome! This was our first example with a circle class. Now let's go to another example of our backpack class. You will see how modifying one of the backpacks changes all of the other aliases that we can use in a program. Let's start by defining our backpack class. In this case, we will just write the items attribute and add a getter so we can access the items attribute, like this. Okay, so we will create a backpack instance, like this. Then your backpack, we have another instance, and then we can say, for example, her backpack. In this case, we're creating three separate instances, but that, let's say that we don't do this. And instead of this, we just assign this but like this, expecting that we will be creating sort of like copies of the backpack. If we are not aware of the consequences of creating aliases, we might end up with something like this, three aliases for the same backpack object. If we print, the result of using the is operator on these three instances, we can see that the three references point to the same object. They are all referencing the same object in memory. So let's see the possible consequences of doing this in our program without knowing that we are doing it. If we define the method at item that we had in some of our previous examples, self.items.append item, and we want to define this method remove item, and we say if the item is in the list of items, then we want to remove the item, else we print the message, this item is not in the backpack. Okay, so we've implemented these two methods, add item and remove item. Let's call these methods on one of the instances, for example, my backpack. We want to add a water bottle to the backpack, and we also want to add some candy. If we print the list of items in the backpack, in the instance that we have been using so far, my backpack, we see that the changes were applied correctly. The water bottle and the candy were added to the backpack's list of items. But something unexpected is also happening. If we check the list of items in your backpack and in her backpack, and we run the code, we see that now all three backpacks have the same list of items, water bottle and candy. Why? Because when we modified this object and we added this item, these items to the list, we are actually modifying the object itself. And these three names are used to access the same object because they are aliases. As you can see, this is a potential source of bugs, so you have to be very, very careful when you create an alias in your program, and possibly try to avoid it as much as possible, because this can have unintended consequences in the program when you make changes. Awesome! Now you know how to identify aliasing in Python, how it works, and the possible consequences of creating aliases. Now let's see two very important concepts in object-oriented programming. You will see them in Python very commonly, even if you're not referring explicitly to object-oriented programming. These are the concepts of mutability and immutability. Let's see how they work. According to Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, mutation means change. A change is a significant and basic alteration. And that is basically what mutation is in programming too, a change that we make to an object. An object can be classified as either mutable or immutable. It is mutable when it can be modified in the program after it has been defined, just like a list. And it is immutable when it can't be modified, like a tuple or a string. We can't change the characters of a string, just like we can't update the elements of a tuple so they are immutable. Mutable data types in Python include lists, sets, and dictionaries. 
And the objects that we have been creating so far with our classes are mutable as well, because we can update their state. Let's see an example of something that you must have probably done like a hundred times before watching this video. But this time you will see it from a different perspective, because you will actually be understanding why this is allowed in Python and what is happening behind the scenes. If we define a list with certain elements, they could be any elements in the program, and then we try to update the value at a particular index of the list. If we print the value of the list after making this modification, let's see what we get. We see the list updated. Now the element at the index that we specified was updated. Instead of seven, we have the value five. Let's see what is happening behind the scenes when this occurs. What happens behind the scenes is that we are storing the list object in memory. But when we change it right here with the index and we update the element, we are changing the actual object in memory. We are mutating it. We are making the change directly to the object. So the variable a will now reference the updated object in memory. This is an example of a mutable object. In contrast, let's start diving into immutable objects. Immutable data types in Python include Boolean values, integers, floats, strings, and tuples. Previously, we were working with a list, so now let's change this to a tuple, which is an immutable data type. Right here, we immediately see a yellow warning provided by PyCharm that says tuples don't support item assignment. This message is telling us that tuples are immutable, so this line will throw an error. Let's save the file and run the code to see it. We see type error, tuple object does not support item assignment. And this is just because tuples are an immutable data type. We cannot update their values once they have been assigned, their elements. Another example is a string. Right here, if we are trying to change a particular character at an index of the string to another character, we will see another warning. Because strings are immutable, we cannot change their values. Right here, we can see this. Type error, string object does not support item assignment. Right here, we are representing that we've created the tuple in memory and it has its own ID. When we try to update it, the object cannot be changed. It is like locked because it is immutable. The same happens with strings and with any other object from an immutable data type. They cannot be updated once they have been defined in the program. So remember, an object can be classified as either mutable or immutable. Mutable means that it can be modified and immutable means that it cannot be modified. Please take a moment to think about the importance of choosing the correct data type for a value, mutable or immutable. Why is it important that we choose a mutable data type for certain situations and immutable data types for other situations? Also, think about the risks of choosing the wrong data type. Think about this, and when you're ready, go to the next video to learn more about these concepts. Welcome back. Now let's see the advantages and disadvantages of mutable and immutable objects, when they should be used, and the risk of aliasing. So let's begin. We will start with the advantages of mutable objects, objects that can be changed. This type of object tends to be more memory efficient, because we can reuse existing objects and modify them, instead of creating or making new copies for each small change that we have to make. We don't have to create a new copy, we can just reuse the object by modifying it in memory. They are also very helpful to represent real-world objects that are mutable by nature. However, they do have some disadvantages. For example, using mutable objects in a program might introduce bugs. Why? Because you might unintentionally mutate an object in the program. Of course, that is not enough reason to avoid using mutable objects because they are incredibly helpful. It's just that when you use them in your program, you have to be really, really careful about what you do with that object. 
to avoid unintentionally mutating the object and causing unexpected behaviors in your program. Let's see an example in our code. In this example, we have a function called add absolute values. This function will take a sequence, in this case it will be a list, and it will take each one of these elements in the list, it will find the absolute value of the element, which is just its positive value, and then it will add all of those values and return the value, the total sum of the absolute values. So take a moment to analyze this function. Try to find the bug in this function. The intended purpose of this function is to keep the list intact. Analyze this line by line and see if you can determine why this is not working like we intended. Pause the video and then come back. Welcome back. The source of the bug right here is that we are replacing the value in the sequence right here. We are finding the absolute value of the element and then we are assigning that value to the list. Okay? So right here, we are actually mutating the list that we passed as argument. Remember that you learned that in Python, objects are passed by reference. So right here, when we assign a value to the list, we are mutating the list that we passed as argument. And that is not what we initially intended. Let's check this in our code. Values before, we say values before calling the function. And since the value is returned, we have to assign it to a variable. We pass the list values right here. Right here, we need to add an S. And then we are going to print values after. If we save the file and we run the code, we see this. Before we call the function, the numbers are negative before we call the function at this point in the program. But after we call the function, the values are changed. Now they are their absolute values, which are positive. So we've mutated the list. And let's say that this was not our initial intention. This is not what we intended to do when we wrote the function. So this is an example of how mutable objects can be prone to unexpected changes. Great, now you know the advantages and the disadvantages of mutable objects. So let's check out the potential risks of aliasing, because they are closely related to mutable objects. One of the risks is mutating objects. We might mutate an object unintentionally through an alias. Remember that aliases are multiple names or references that we create for the same object in memory. When we create aliases, we might unintentionally mutate an object using one of those names and affect all the other names that reference the object in the program. So this is one of the possible risks. Like in this case, we have two variables, A and B, referencing the same list. If we change the list using the variable A, the variable B will be affected as well if we use it in the program we will get or work with the modified object instead of the object that we believe we initially assigned to this variable. Let's see how we can mutate an object through an alias. If we define a list with the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we create an alias for this list object right here, let's say that we don't know that this is actually creating an alias, and we just think that by assigning A to B, we are making a copy of the list. If we don't know this, then we might try to update a value in list B. We might write this somewhere in our program, and then if we check what happens to list B, and we run the code, we can see that list B is modified like we intended. The first value was updated to 15 at index 0. But what happens if we check the value of A? We might initially think that A is not affected because we are not writing A anywhere on this line. But if we run the code, you will see that both values are the same. A was also modified and the new value is 15 at index 0. So we are modifying the object unintentionally through an alias that could make the program work unexpectedly and provide the wrong output or results. This also takes us to the advantages of immutable objects. 
Since they can't be modified, they are less likely to introduce bugs in your program. So we can say that they are sort of like safer from bugs. They can also be easier to understand because we know their exact value without any hidden or unexpected changes like it might occur with mutable objects. So they are very helpful when we need to create values or objects that should never change in the program, like for example tuples. However, they do have certain disadvantages. They are less efficient in terms of memory usage if you want to modify them. Because to modify or to create a new object with some modifications, you would need to create a new copy of the object. You don't need to make an entirely new copy of the object to make any changes. And this can be costly depending on the complexity of the internal structure of the object. So in cases where the object would have to be modified, it is preferable to use mutable objects, like a list, for example, versus a tuple. Let's see an example of how we can create a new tuple based on the content of another tuple. Let's say that you've defined a tuple with the elements 1, 2, 3, and 4. You chose to use a tuple in your program, but then you realize that you have to add an element right here between the elements 2 and 3. We will add the number 7. But when we try to add an element, we realize that tuples are immutable. We cannot add an element to a tuple. So we might try to find a possible solution using tuple slicing. For that, we would have to take these two elements from index 0 to index 1 inclusive. So we write 2 right here. We might concatenate that tuple to a new tuple with just one element, the value 7. And then we might include all the elements from index 2 up to the end of the list. This would give us, let's say, let's see right here what we get. Right here we have a new tuple with the element 7 where we wanted it to be. Like this. If we print both of these tuples, we will see the change. Right here, now we have the value 7. So there is a way to add an element to a tuple, but let's see what happens behind the scenes. If we print the ID of the first tuple and we print the ID of the second tuple that we have created, right here from concatenating the previous tuples, we see that their IDs are different. And what does this mean? Well, that the two tuples are different objects. Right here, we created an object that we used initially. And then, right here, by concatenating several tuples, we're creating a new object in memory. And if this tuple is more complex, has more elements, or if the object is more complex instead of a tuple, then this would be really costly in terms of memory usage because you are creating an entirely new object in memory, and you can confirm this with the ID. In this case, we are creating two separate objects with the same value, but the old object is no longer accessible after we update the variable. The variable A is now referring to the new tuple, the tuple that we created by concatenating other tuples. So this old object will be garbage collected automatically since we updated the reference and now this object, the old object, doesn't have any reference to it in the program. Great! Based on disadvantages and disadvantages, think about when you should use mutable and immutable objects or data types in your program. For some scenarios, it will be very helpful to use mutable data types. And for other scenarios, it will be more helpful to use immutable data types. So think about this and then move on to the next video. Welcome to this example, where we will see an example of what can happen if we try to work with a mutable object, like a dictionary in this case, and we perform some operations without knowing how they affect that object. This will result in a bug. We have a function called remove even values that takes a dictionary as an argument. This function will iterate over all the key value pairs of the dictionary using a for loop. Like we can see right here, we have the key, we have the value. And right here, we are iterating over the list of key value pairs of the dictionary. And we say, if the value of the pair 
is even, so it is divisible by 2, evenly divisible by 2, then what are we going to do? We are going to delete that key value pair. So far, so good, right? Initially, our logic seems to be correct. We are getting all the key value pairs. We are finding the pairs that meet our criteria, and then we are deleting the pairs. But let's see what happens behind the scenes, because I know that this might surprise you. If we have a dictionary called my dictionary with these key value pairs, A, B, C, and D, we will keep this dictionary simple to focus on the function, okay? If we call the function remove even values like this, and we run the code, we might assume that these key value pairs will be removed, B and D, right? Because we are finding even values in the key value pairs to delete those pairs. But if we run the code, we will see this runtime error. Dictionary change size during iteration. Let's analyze this error in detail. This is a runtime error. So it's, it is a type of exception thrown when the program is running. It says that the dictionary changed size during iteration. Why would it change size? Well, remember that right here, we are deleting key value pairs. And this deletion occurs inside the for loop. That is why we see this line right here. When we delete a key value pair, we are mutating the dictionary. We are changing the number of key value pairs it contains. And that is essential for this value right here because we are getting a list of items from the dictionary that are left to evaluate or to assign to these loop variables. So the loop doesn't know how many iterations are left because we changed the size of the dictionary during the iterations. So this is an example of the risks of mutation. And you have to be very careful when you work with mutable objects. But wouldn't it be really nice to be able to create sort of like a clone for this dictionary, a copy of this dictionary so we can iterate over all its elements and still modify the original dictionary? Well, we can do it through a process called cloning. You will learn more about cloning in the next video. So we'll see you there. Let's see what cloning is all about and how we can use it in Python to prevent bugs like the one that you saw in the previous example. Let's see what it is and how it works. Cloning is the process of creating an exact copy of the object. And this copy is completely independent from the original object. It is like the opposite of aliasing because the new object that we create, the clone, is not connected to the previous object at all. It is completely independent from the original object. For example, right here we have an object and its clone. When we create the clone, they are initially exactly the same. They have all the same attributes, methods, and other properties. But if we modify the clone during the program, or if we modify the original object, then the other one will not be affected because they are completely independent. So instead of having something like this, two references that point to the same object, so they are aliases, we will have something like this. Independent references to different objects in memory. They will be initially the same. They will have the same value initially, but we can modify them and the other one will not be affected. Previously, when we saw the risks of aliasing, we said that if we have a mutable object and we create an alias for that object, we can modify the object with any one of the aliases. We had this example, right? We said that we could modify list B and that would also affect list A. If we print both lists, you can see that the change affects these two variables because they are pointing or referring to the same object. You can see that their first value is now 15 instead of 1. So how can we solve this? Well, we can use cloning, which is really, really nice. To clone a list, we can just write this. We write the syntax that we use for list slicing to get a slice of the list. And within the square brackets, we just write a colon. That indicates that we want to get a copy of the list 
from the first element up to the last element, including all the elements in between. So we're basically getting a clone. After adding this to our code, if we run the code, we can see that we modified list B right here. And this change was reflected for this list, list B. But now list A is not affected. And that is really, really awesome, right? We are no longer working with aliases. We are creating a clone of the list right here. And that clone is independent from the other object. So they are not affected. Awesome. Now that you know more about cloning, let's go back to our example where we changed the size of the dictionary. Right here, we have our example. The function remove even values dictionary. The dictionary is taken as an argument. And we have a for loop where we iterate over the key value pairs. And if the value is even, we remove that key value pair from the dictionary. Let's remember real quick the error that we got when we ran the code. Right here, we can see it. It is a runtime error dictionary change size during iteration. OK. So how can we solve this? Well, we can create a clone of the dictionary right here. We just need to add one word. It is literally one word. We are calling the method copy right here on the dictionary. This creates a copy of the dictionary that we passed as an argument. It is an independent copy, like a clone. And after we have that copy, we can get all its key value pairs for the iterations. Then for each iteration, we are going to check if the value is even. And this is the key. This is the key. We are going to remove the key value pair from the original dictionary that we got as an argument. We are using the copy only to iterate over the key value pairs. But we are not using that copy to mutate the object. When we delete the key value pair, we are deleting it from the original dictionary. So that way, we can mutate the dictionary and still use it in the for loop. This is really, really awesome, right? Let's print the dictionary after calling the function so we can see the changes. Let's save the file and run the code. Now you can see that we don't have an error anymore. We only have A1 and C3, the key value pairs with odd values. And that is how you can solve this bug. You can just make a copy of the dictionary for the loop and then mutate the dictionary using those values. Awesome work. Now you know how cloning works and how you can use it. Most data types will have a way to create a clone that is an independent copy of the original object. You can work with it and modify it and the original object will not be affected.